Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So Ben Tasker is, is here visiting us today. Uh, he was an undergraduate at Stanford and then stayed on for his graduate studies under Daphne Kohler. Uh, and then after that he, he moved a very far distance all the way up to Berkeley uh, to spend two years postdocing with Michael Jordan. Um, and he has been probably one of the premier people working on uh, structured learning problems. I think that would be the single biggest area of your focus, but he's, he's worked on a, a wide variety of machine learning problems. So it's our pleasure today to have Ben Tasker visiting us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tasha. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks everyone for coming to the talk. So my name is Ben, and please feel free to ask questions in the middle. I, I think I enjoy giving talks when, when there's interaction, so, so stop me anytime. Okay, so machine learning as a field has been, has been uh, I think, you know, somewhat obsessed with the, the basic problem of classification. It's a very important problem, so in, in an example that's near and dear to uh, our hearts is, you know, spam classification. We get an email message, we want to classify it as, um, as spam or not spam. We have a, a handwritten character, we want to classify it as what kind of letter it is, right? It's all well and good, and we're pretty good at solving this problem. So the, what, what's the setup here? The setup is we have an input input uh, space x, right? and then our input is a, a gray, gray level image, or a set of words in the email, a set of other features, and the output is a small set of discrete possibilities. That's the standard setup for basic classification. Now we're good at building classifiers for these kinds of problems. Um, the challenges start coming in when, when we're trying to recognize not a single letter, but say an entire word or a sentence. Or say we're doing image segmentation, so here what you're seeing is uh, a 3D uh, kind of cloud of points that is the Stanford campus um, map. This has been collected by a robot that roamed around and collected this laser range data. So the, the goal here is to segment those, those points in space into buildings, trees, and other objects, right? So again, the space of possible groupings of, of pixels into different objects is huge. Some other problems, uh, so in computational biology, one of the fundamental, fundamental tasks is going from the input X being amino acid sequence to its three-dimensional structure. Right? The space of possible ways to do that is tremendous. Machine translation, we're going from, say, French to, to English. Right? The space of possible outputs is, is, is um, staggering. Now, in all of these problems, there is some kind of structure, either spatial, or sequential or combinatorial that we're going to be exploiting. Um, and this is the key to solving them. Um, so one way to do this, is, is to exploit structure, is very simple. Well, we're going to take our input and break it up into pieces, right? And, and use our own standard algorithms for, for predicting each letter at a time, say, or each pixel at a time, where we take a, a little window and slide it over the, the image and classify each pixel based on just the local information. And the problem with that approach is that it doesn't take into account the correlations between, between the predicted variables, right? So here we have adjacent letters that are correlated. Here we have adjacent pixels that you know, tend to be uh, highly correlated. This information is lost in this kind of approach. So here's an example of applying this uh, to this segmentation data. So red is building, green is tree, blue is bushes and shrubs, uh, and white is ground. As you can see, you know, the buildings are mostly red, the, the, the trees are pretty much green, but the predictions are extremely incoherent, right? There's no spatial coherence that's enforced by this approach. And so you have buildings uh, sort of mixing with trees, trees growing on top of buildings, shrubs on top of buildings, et cetera, et cetera. What we want, oh, so here's just a close-up of the, of the data. This is the top of an arcade. This is uh, a window. You know, uh, it's getting a lot of these things very wrong. What we really want is models that, not just, uh, that take into account not just local information, but global information as well. So we want a model that takes our input, the entire input, and produces an output in a way that's uh, globally satisfactory. Right? So it exploits correlations between those variables as well as constraints between them. 
So that's the overall approach I'm going to take. And that's what I call the problem of structured prediction, of taking a complex input and producing a complex output where the set of variables we're predicting are, are, are um, computed jointly, taking into account correlations and constraints. So just an example of applying this kind of, uh, these kinds of models, right, this is uh, a model I'm going to describe later, but just to show you the, the difference here, all of the sort of previously uh, bad areas are cleaned up in a, in a model that actually takes into account the local coherence properties of this kind of uh, data. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, several models of this sort, structured prediction models, and I'll concentrate on a very specific one, but the approach is, very, is fairly general. So I'm going to talk about this learning framework for s learning these structured prediction problems and several algorithms uh, that we've developed that scale up to large data sets. Uh, and I'll talk about three different applications. One of them is, is word alignment for machine translation. Uh, one of them is segmentation, and one of them is uh, protein folding, a problem in protein folding. Okay, so word alignment. It's a problem that, that uh, a lot of people here are familiar with, and it's, a, it's a, one of the key steps in building a machine translation system. So um, <clears throat> our input is pairs of sentences, uh, and our out output is correspondence between the words in the two sentences. So here, for simplicity, I made a very kind of simple correspondence where each word corresponds to at most one other one in the French. This is not a fundamental restriction. We actually relax it later. But for simplicity, assume we're doing, roughly speaking, a one-to-one -one correspondence. And so once we have this, a, machine, a typical machine translation system uses the alignment to build up statistics on phrase-to-phrase -phrase, uh, uh, probabilities and other types of things. But this is basically the, one of the first steps that's done in almost all of them. So our input is a pair of sentences. Our output is a matching between the words in the two sentences. And so how are we going to represent this? Well, we're going to have a binary variable for each pair of positions, position J, position K. And this binary variable is going to say whether those two words are in correspondence, whether they're um, aligned to each other. So. <clears throat> Now, if we're trying to build a, a predictive model that predicts y given x, we can imagine doing something like this. We're going to build a realistic model of y given x by taking a bunch of local potentials or local scores and multiplying them together and normalizing. So if you think of conditional random fields, a standard approach that people have been using a lot in, for sequence problems, this is a kind of a, a random field. So what do we have here? We have for each edge, uh, a scoring function that basically measures the, the affinity, the propensity of, of these two words to align to each other. So the higher this particular number is, the more likely is going to be an assignment, an, uh, sorry, an alignment that includes it. Right? So the score has to be positive for this, or non negative, for this to be a probability, assi probability distribution. We multiply all of these scores together and we normalize to get a probability. So a very simple model uh, for. for for this problem. Now, how do we parameterize this, this potential? What, is, what does this score mean? How does this compute it? Well, the standard way to do this is to represent it as a kind of parametric function of features, some kind of feature of the input. And so we have some parameters, theta, and then features um, of the input. So an example of that. So an example would be the actual words that occur in those two positions. So the English word, the French word, right? The, feature, the value of that feature is, say, 1. The parameter maybe is 0.4. Um, we might also have features like, well, where is it in the sequence, right? So um, this is in the end, right? This is somewhere in the middle. What is the absolute distance between those positions? What is the relative distance between those positions? We can look at orthography between those two words, right? So how closely are they spelled? What is string, string at a distance between them? If these are kind of farther away languages, we might look at some kind of phonetic distance between them, right, uh, for, to detect place names and things like that. So if it's representation, how do you represent one to many or many to one mapping between the models? Yeah, so you can imagine, so yeah, so I, I'm talking about the simple model where you have one to one, 
you can relax the matching to be two to two, three to three, etc., etc. Right? So. Uh, one to two. Oh, one to two is fine as well, right? So at most, right? So, so the constraint we're going to have later is to say that the degree is limited. The fertility, the maximum fertility is limited, but it could be anything in between. Uh, in that case, y, j, k represent. You have y, j, one, y, j, two that represent the same one single j that corresponds to one. Yeah, two. exactly. So I think there might be a single j uh, that has several y, j, k, and y, j, m that are on. That's perfectly legal. Mm -hmm. But for simplicity, let's assume they're matchings for now. It's just easier to think about this. Uh, so those, that's how you construct your score, right? We have some features and we have some parameters and we parameterize our, our uh, edge score that way. Now the, the question we're going to be concerning ourselves with is, is how to learn this data from data. The features we assume are given by the expert. Okay, so Somebody gave us the model, features and, and parameters. How do we get a matching, the correspondence between words? Well, we form a complete graph. We compute the scores the, the, by multiplying the features and the weights. And to find the most likely wedge, matching, um, we run the, uh, the bipartite matching algorithm. So, right, so because our, our scores are basically edgewise, right, we just take the log of, of the probabilities, we get score decomposing into little pieces, and then the most likely matching is simply the, the, the highest weighted, uh, maximum weighted bipartite matching. And so there are efficient algorithms for doing this. They're, they're essentially n-cubed, but um, they're in practice, they're, they're, they're actually faster. So we know how to do the prediction once we have the model. The question is, how do we learn the parameters for this kinds of model? And so I'll be, I'll be talking about this particular problem as my example, but the same applies in models for segmentation, et cetera, et cetera. There's an efficient algorithm that's combinatorial uh, algorithm to predict. Now the question is, how do we learn the parameters for that algorithm? Then you had, on the previous slide, you had two different positions. Things, when you said absolute distance and relative distance, uh -huh. how do you, can you define those and show how they're computable as edgewise? Uh, yeah, so this is just, so this is position number, I don't know, 10, say, and this is position number 5. So the difference between them is 5. Okay, these, these don't exactly correspond to those, so they're just examples. Relative, 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 relative to the length of the sentence? Exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. So this is, you don't model first order. So actually, there's going to be a model later, what we do. Uh, in this simple one, it's all edgewise. Mm -hmm. So you will hope that you have the same kind of feature for different languages matching and hoping that for some of the languages which are more in line with each other in terms of the word orders, the weight will become smaller. Mm -hmm. exactly. thing with that difference in terms of the features. Right, yeah. So for different yeah, so for different languages those relative features are gonna be yeah, so in some languages where there's a lot of rearrangement, those features might be completely ir irrelevant. Example, if two languages happen to have, you know, almost the same kind of order, yes. then the distance probably may not be that important. Then what do you bother to put this? No, actually, then it is very important. The, uh, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. The, the other one. Yeah, so okay. English and French is mostly monotonic, right? There's a lot of just little local rearrangements, but it's mostly monotonic. And there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of other languages where it's not true. Well, the issue is that. For those differences, do you put the emphasis on the feature or do you put emphasis on the parameters that you learn? So the yeah. the product, you know, makes a difference. So how sure, sure. So the learning algorithm is worried about getting the thetas. The person who's trying to make this word alignment system to work is worried about the features. And the features are, you know, that's that's the separation. Do you have a question back? Yeah, so you said this is order n cubed and I guess test fit. So what was what do you mean by n? N is the sum number number of nodes, total number of nodes. Okay. Uh, so in the number of edges it's actually well if you yeah, it's uh, number of edges here is n squared. Right? So so like the Hungarian algorithm or the algorithm like flow algorithms will solve this problem. N cubed those n is number of these guys and number of those guys. Okay, so we know how to do the prediction once we have the model. How do we learn these models? Okay, so here's our model in this case. Right? It's just the product of these local edge scores. And um, I'm going to be talking about the supervised version of this. Right? So we have labeled data. 
we went out there and labeled word alignments, right? This word comes from this word, etc., etc. So I have n examples like that. I'm going to have several methods for learning theta that I'm going to discuss. Um, but then the prediction part, let me just make sure that this is all fixed, is that here it's a weighted matching or some other combinatorial algorithm. So in, for segmentation model, it turns out this to be a min-cut algorithm. Uh, or in, in general, maybe if you're learning sequence models or, or context-free grammars like parsing, it might be a dynamic program that computes the prediction. Once you have the model, the, there's something that computes the best y, the most likely y. Right? So we're not going to worry about that prediction algorithm. That's fixed. What's not fixed is how to learn this data, and then we're going to discuss methods for doing that. Okay, so method number one, simplest one, is, is kind of a local method. I'm going to talk about what exactly it means, but essentially it's just to say, well, forget about the fact that y is this kind of structured object, this matching or something. I'm going to just look at little, its little pieces and try to predict them separately. Uh, another standard approach that works for a lot of these models uh, is maximizing likelihood, conditional likelihood uh, or standard likelihood. It turns out for the models that we're talking about, matchings and, and min cuts, this is not tractable. So we cannot do this exactly. And the third method is what I'm going to be talking about, this margin-based criterion where several of these problems can be solved very efficiently. Okay, so what do I mean by local estimation? The idea is, okay, well, I'm going to have my matching. I'm going to take each edge and, and kind of treat it, uh, not only the edges that appear, but also the ones that don't appear, potential edges, and treat it as an independent sample. I'm going to learn a classifier that says, is this edge present or not? Right? So then I can use any kind of classifier I want there, uh, and then take the output of that classifier, its confidence or whatever its output is, and stick it into my matching. And so... Uh, find kind of the maximum weighted matching where the weights are given by a local classifier. And so people have done something like this. Uh, and it's simple and cheap, right? It's very easy to do. Um, but it turns out in a lot of these problems, it's not, it doesn't work very well. And the problem is that it's not taken into account everything that's going on in, in, in the problem. There's, you know, the biggest kind of uh, effect that's going on in this model is competition, right? That the words compete for each other. There's this one-to-one -one or two-to-two -two constraint. And then when you're doing this locally, uh, you're not really calibrating for that competition. And I'll show empirically why, uh, that it doesn't, it doesn't work as well as, you know, thinking about this more globally. Conditional likelihood estimation. This is a method that's standard for a lot of these problems. Uh, what we do is we try to find theta that maximizes log likelihood. In this case, conditional log likelihood. So this is the, the objective. Here, I mean, uh, we're maximizing theta. Uh, I put a supremum in there over some theta some set theta, uh, large capital theta, where that set is either just all of Euclidean space, right? Theta is just anything, or it's something regularized, like we say theta is in some ball of norm one. Right? So this is our conditional log likelihood problem. Well, as we unpack this definition of our, our likelihood, we see that the, 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 uh, the partition function, where we need to normalize our distribution sum to one, is something that's actually very hard. In our case, we need to sum over all possible matchings, right? Over all possible ways to align these two, uh, two sentences in order to compute what is the true probability. And so when we try to maximize this, this is, this is, we, need, we need to basically compute that. And computing this sum over all matchings weighted by this thing is sharply complete. And this is also true for models for segmentations like MinCut. Question? Yes. Right. So we, we yeah, definitely. So we've tried this. Actually, I'm not showing results on this. I'm showing the three approaches I talked about. The results of, uh, of what we do are, are slightly better than perceptron, uh, but they're, 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 uh, they're much more stable. And, and uh, the, you know, there's, there's a, um, so yeah, I, don't have, I don't have those numbers on the slides I'm coming up, but that's, that's one of the competitors. And so the problems with perceptron are, are, is, uh, as Bob can tell you, is that, uh, is that it's actually, somewhat unstable algorithm. I mean, there's this kind of a, a, a black art of getting it to work well. It's extremely sensitive to the order of the data. Order of the data, initialization point, and so on. So I'm going to be talking about basically a, a nice version of the same thing, right? So, so a convex optimization problem that we're going to get that basically solves a problem no matter where you start and has guarantees. Right? But, but the, the idea is right. I mean, the, we're, trying, we're going to use that intuition. So let me, let me just, it'll become clear. 
So the, 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 here, the, the key thing is that we have a tractable model. We can do the inference. Uh, we can find the, the best y. But to learn it we have, you know, in a standard way is intractable. And so we go to the, the next method. And so what do we want? I mean, the idea is similar to the perceptor. We want a probabilistic model such that as we find the argmax, right, uh, for our training data, we hear x, y, y, i are the pair of labeled data. We find the, you know, that the, the model prefers the truth over everything else. So just to be more concrete, here's our you know, little input, and this is the right matching. We want that to be true. Another way to put it is to say the probability of the true guy, the true labeling given the input, is better than probability on the rest. Right? So this way of looking at it is, is uh, beneficial because we don't actually really worry about the absolute value of these probabilities. What we care about is just their relative value, making sure that the truth is better than, scores better than all the rest. And that's the key intuition in this kind of likelihood approaches versus, versus margin-based approaches is that uh, you don't really care about the partition function, the normalization. All you care about is the relative ratio. So more concretely, is, this is our model, right? And what we're going to look at is this, the odds ratio between the truth, probability of the truth, and probability of an alternate, right? When we look at this ratio, the denominator doesn't matter, right? It drops out. So uh, we want this thing to be positive. We want it to be greater than zero for all other y's. Right, and that's the idea. If this is true, then we don't care really what the likelihood is. We know that the model will be giving us the right answer on the training data. So the margin that we're going to be maximizing is something like this, right? It's basically going to try to find this, the worst case y, uh, right? So this, the one where the odds ratio is the smallest. And that's the one we're going to care about because the decision boundary basically depends on, on the worst guy, guy. Is clear? Okay, good. Okay, so the, the estimation problem is going to be find theta that you know, maximizes the idea of this margin that I'm going to define more concretely. And after some work, we can show that this, this optimization problem can be solved uh, in an efficient way. So, so in that case, go back to the previous slide. So uh, if you don't have the constraint that... Uh, I think something wrong. So, so, Somehow, perceptor has, you, you can also say perceptor has this particular uh, uh, it's trying to function. Do. But you have, a you have a limit that, uh, you have a constraint that uh, uh, your uh, the denominator the in log odds is uh, uh, probably just going to go get out back. Well, well if, if it's not clear later, ask me again, I guess. So, yeah. So I, I see the perceptor has the same uh, objective function as logic. So perceptor doesn't have an objective function. It's more of a, it's the problem with perceptor that it, it's basically a procedure as opposed to a, you know, a declarative problem where you're trying to optimize something, right? So it's a procedure that basically tries to, to modify the model in response to errors. But you can see that perceptor has this objective function and you use, uh, if you use... Uh, perceptor is going to be happy when this is true, when this is, this is greater than zero. So perceptor is going to stop. Whether you're going to get there or not, and right. what happens when there is no such model, right. is, and then when the model is large, is a, is a question. Okay, so um, one of the other key, key important pieces in structure prediction is that the, the way we evaluate our models, right, is, is not exactly the same as in, in uh, standard classification, right? So we make a prediction y uh, for, for a particular um, input yi, we pay a certain penalty, right? And usually, we're talking about matchings or parse trees or uh, labeling sequences. That penalty function is some, some, something like the proportion of, say, edges or positions we got right, or it's precision or recall. But it's basically it's something that we get partial credit for being right, you know, most of the time. So it's not something that says did you get everything right. So zero one loss that's usually used in in uh, in standard classification is not a really good fit. What we've been using for several reasons is something like Hemming loss. So, uh, you know, basically the error counts how many error the the loss function counts how many errors you've made. Is this really Hemming loss? Or Hemming loss. You also counted the things that weren't there, that, that aren't there that should be. So, is it an error that uh, is it an additional error that that is linked to the, the second one? 
Uh, the, this is on. Well, yeah, there's different okay, ways to do it. Okay, so you're, you're only counting the false positives here, and I thought right, right. also counted false negatives. So there's a great difference we do. Actually, we, well, what we actually do is we, we, have, um, we have something that weighs the two, two, two different uh, errors in a different way. So it's, kind of a, it's, a, it's a weighted combination of false positives and false negatives. Yeah, this is, I guess, for, for illustration and, and uh, yeah, so, um, right, you can, you can, you're flexible. As long as basically your loss function decomposes with the edges, we're happy. And you can count them in different ways. And actually, it actually really helps to be able to, to do that to control precision recall. So, um, um, what we do is actually try to make this odds ratio be sensitive to the loss function. And so the intuition for, for doing that is that, the more wrong a particular matching is, right, the more wrong uh, a guess that you're going to be evaluating is, then the more confident you should be in rejecting it, right? So the, the more this, this odds ratio should be, right? So we, we make sure that the scales with proportional to this loss function. And so we want to kind of make sure this happens. So we maximize the difference, right? So bring this over to the side. We want to try to maximize this. And moreover, we're trying to find the worst case one where this is, uh, this is bad. So this is the margin we're trying to minimize. The odds ratio is segmented by the loss function. So we worry about the odds ratio being, being small uh, much more when the loss is large. Right? And we can show that this, there is kind of a, uh, a <coughs> computational learning theory uh, way of looking at this by saying that this, this loss function is minimizing essentially an upper bound on empirical loss on the training data. Right? But this is, and the intuition here is that we're worrying about the odds ratios instead of likelihoods. We're trying to make the truth be better than everybody else. Okay, so let's unpack that a little bit. So this is the odds ratio. And given our model, right, we plug, plugging in this expression, we have theta multiplying essentially the statistics of the truth and minus statistics of this the um, you know, y that we're trying to suggest here, right? So like, this is the difference between kind of the true sufficient statistics and the you know, sufficient statistics of, a, of an alternate. And we're going to call this difference in statistics this fi of y. So there's going to be the odds ratio is going to be linear in theta and then depend on just the difference between the statistics of the two. And the margin is that, it's taking the, the odds ratio and the loss, and then just plugging in, plugging in the, our new definition of theta phi, we get this following optimization problem, right? So in terms of theta, it's, this kind of, it's linear in theta, our objective. But then the, embedded in this problem is this big min over all possibilities. And so you could think of perceptron as doing something, you know, uh, of basically generating one possibility after another from this, this min, trying to find things that are violated. But a way to solve this problem uh, in this kind of convex optimization framework is to say, well, I'm going to take this min and convert it into a, something that I can, I can work with in a, with a you know, standard LP, or QP solver. And the way you do that is you introduce these variables that are going to be essentially representing the min. So there's going to be a variable for each example is going to be less than this particular quantity, or the same quantity here, right? And so it's going to be less than all of them, all of the different possibilities y. And as I maximize each of those variables, right, um, then the state is going to be hitting against this, right? So I maximize, so it's going to be become basically the smallest of, of all of these for y. So it's going to become essentially the min. Right? So it's a standard transformation that basically says, I have a min, I'm going to make it um, I'm going to make it a, a continuous variable, right? So when I solve this problem, maximizing over theta and psi simultaneously, I'm going to get the same answer as maximizing the problem above, right? Is this clear? If it's not, let me just... Just to make sure that, so the L is the loss function which is defined a priori. Yes. So you... Yeah, that's fixed. So if you use a Hamming distance, then how, how do you justify that? So you just have to use prior knowledge to know that this kind of loss is sensible. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. So usually it's natural to say, you know, how many bits did you get wrong? How many positions in a sequence? How many brackets? Something somewhat... Well, so, so, so I'm trying to think, uh, because uh, when we do speech recognition, we have something very, very similar to this. We have F, the way, exactly the way it defines this. Mm -hmm. And then we use the sigmoid function. Mm -hmm. 
that is superimposed on the f function. Mm -hmm. Once you have that, you get the uh, error count. Right? Mm -hmm. If it's right, mm -hmm. then you get, uh, you know, the, once it's really wrong, you get count of one. Okay. And if it's not really, you know, wrong, just slightly wrong, you get the big count of half or something. Sure. So, uh, so, so is that? No, this is that, that's slightly different. So that's, that's actually measuring the output of the model. This loss is saying, I have a particular labeling, particular assignment, and you're saying, how different is that from the true assignment? This is, this is measuring. Right? So it's not, it's nothing to do with the model, actually. Right? This thing is just independent of what theta is. You're just saying, if I were to guess this, how much would I pay? Okay. So in that case, you do not optimize the error, per se. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to, so by, by doing, minimizing this, um, I'm minimizing a convex upper bound on the error. So if you think about the hinge loss, you know, these kind of pictures people draw, right? You have, this is your 0, 1 loss, and you have hinge loss upper bounding it, right, in SVMs. This is a very similar idea, is that this is going to be a, a convex upper bound on something that's, that's very non-convex, right? So here is what you're saying, is kind of the output of the model, this theta phi, all right, roughly if speaking. I do, if I do a sigmoid function, you, I actually can get error count. Uh, error count? I'm not sure. Okay. Number, number of bits you got wrong. Maybe we'll just take this offline. I mean, this is, that's a different way of doing it. So the problem with this, this enumeration type of approach, right, is that the number of constraints is exponential, right? Here what we've done in order to take care of this min is we enumerated every other possible matching, right? And uh, the approximation to that is to do something either just to sample these constraints or greedily add them. And this is people, so Perceptron kind of does that greedily. Uh, and so Thomas, uh, Hoffman, and, and other people have, have looked at doing this, again, greedily, by adding one constraint at a time. And the problem with that is that you need to be resolving these quadratic programs every time. And uh, the, the guarantees that you get for doing that are actually fairly loose in terms of how, how long it takes to, to solve these. And so our approach is to solve this problem exactly by reformulating it slightly. And I'll show how to do that. So we don't need to go to approximations. And so how do we do that? So as we take the, this discrete problem on top where we have you know, continuous optimization on top, uh, continuous optimization on the, on the outside, discrete optimization on the inside. And we're going to swap in something that com basically computes the min um, in a continuous way, so that we have a set of other variables and a different optimization problem that uh, functions as the min inside. And so that optimization problem is going to be you know, looking very similar, uh, but basically doing the same job. And so once we get into this form, where we have continuous optimization over theta, continuous optimization over z that's basically doing the same thing, you're going to have exactly the same problem, uh, so exactly the same answer for those two problems. Okay, so and I'll show how to do this for this the very simple case of by by Pythet matchings, but it's it's much more generally applicable. It's, you know, it works for min cuts and and it works for um, context-free grammars and sequences, etc. But in in case of matchings, it's particularly simple. So here's our min min problem, right? Uh, we have find y that basically is kind of the worst violator, right? So the state of f i is basically find me the y that that has the worst log odds ratio. And then it's also being helped by this loss, loss function. Now, the space of possibilities right now, I just made it very simple here, is basically all matchings that are at most one, degree at most one. Right? You can get, you can get you know, more fancy with this. And the basic idea is to go from this discrete problem to a continuous one. And in case of matching, it's very simple. We're going to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between these discrete variables that are between 0 and 1 and continuous variables that are between 0 and 1. Oh, sorry, what I say, discrete variables that are 0 or 1, binary variables, and ones that are between 0 and 1. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, that infimum. So, sorry? infimum. So, it's, it's kind of, so, you know, if you have some, something discrete, you put them in. If you're doing something continuous over some space, you have kind of limits, then use inf. So, but think of it as, this being discrete, this is being continuous. Okay, so it's the minimum, minimum over a continuous exactly. variable. Quantity. Right, I just put it there so for contrast. People <laughs> abuse min for continuous things as well, but here it's for emphasis. 
So you know, there's one-to-one correspondence between these binary variables and these continuous variables, right? And then the constraints are basically the same, right? Now the objective function, we need to capture the same objective function in some of these. And it turns out that because of the way we structured our features, right, the features are all edgewise, so that we can just essentially multiply the, the right sort of theta f by the right z to get all of the scores for the edge. And then because we assume we have something like Hemming loss, all of the loss functions also decompose edge by edge. Right? And so we have the objective function from here kind of rewritten this way. And it turns out that <clears throat> solving the problem on the bottom, which is actually a linear program in Z, right? So Z is this linear set, linear polytope, and then this is objective, you know, fixing theta is linear in Z, right? So F is a matrix, L is a, a, a vector, so we have an LP. So the question is, okay, well, what have we lost by going from this discrete optimization problem, which essentially is a matching, uh, to a, a linear program that, you know, where we've gone from binary, pro pro uh, binary variables to continuous variables. So usually when you do that, you lose something, right? The answer you might get is something fractional, right? You get something like 0 0.5 on the edge. What does that mean? Is the edge on or not, right? It turns out that for these problems, this is a well-known fact about matchings, you don't lose anything. So that the answers you get from this are going to be always integral. And so the picture you kind of can think about, a, keep, keep in mind, this is, not, this is more of a cartoon than what's really happening, but you know, imagine the space of all possible discrete possi you know, uh, Ys, right? So it's some, some space is much larger dimensional, but some subset of it, right, of discrete points is feasible. Those are points in red. Now the continuous part is the relaxation of that space, where you know, the Zs now could be fractional, right? You don't have just discrete points. Right? So instead of having this lattice that's, that's integral, we have a convex set that's uh, essentially kind of convex hull of matchings. And then it turns out that the corners of that convex hull are all integral, so they're all valid matchings. And as we optimize a local, sorry, a linear objective over the set, we're going to end up at a corner or a face. But you can think about a corner. So all of the, the solutions of this LP are going to be at corners of this polytope. And all of the corners you can show are integral. So, so, that, so the, the convex hull is piecewise linear the way you've shown it? Yeah. And so the problem on top and the problem on the bottom have the same solution at their optimum. One is a discrete, kind of find me the best matching, and the other one says find me the best, the best um, well, basically, solution to this LP. And this is true also for min cuts and some other problems as well. You can do this all, the same kind of thing for, for um, context-free grammars and... Uh, you know, sequences. So I'm not suggesting this as a, as a way of solving these problems once you have theta, but this is a tool to be used for learning them, right? So we can re-represent the inference problem as a continuous optimization problem. So you have a question? Are, are you using that, that um, the inference was tractable that you were in this learning here or not? Well, yeah. So if, if, if inference was not tractable, then the relaxation would usually have some integrality gap, which means that you can get fractional solutions, and then when you try to round those solutions, you'll get something that's not optimal. So yeah, so if this matching problem was more complicated, and I'll actually show an example where it's more complicated, where we try to incorporate first order terms, um, then the relaxation is not exact. Does that answer? Right, good. So we take this exponential problem, where the, the inside we have this exponential number of uh, things we're trying to minimize over, or uh, exponential number of constraints, and we turn into something that's linear size, linear in the number of edges and parameters. And this thing is going to be at this kind of a, a saddle point problem, where we maximize over theta and minimize over these z's, where the z's are the alternative. So you can think of it as a game, right? So I'm trying to find theta that, minimize, uh, that maximizes margin, and my adversary is trying to come up with essentially kind of matchings, or distributions over matchings, really. Uh, that will make me incur as much loss as possible, right? And so this, and you can think of perception doing that more or less, right? It's sort of, you have a current theta, then you try to find, the adversary tries to find doing, um, something that's basically going to, to make me uh, lose, you know, in terms of uh, error, and then 
is doing that in a very kind of bad way, I think, in terms of optimization. This gives us a convex optimization problem to solve this. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm a little confused over the notation. So z is this enormous vector that's indexed by j and k? So enormous, well, it's, it's the number of variables there is the number of potential edges. Yes? And f is a vector, and f is a vector. So f is a matrix. So L supplies a matrix. Is a vector, OK. L is a vector, yes. OK, but nothing depends on z except for the way it appears linearly in that expression. Yes, so this is a bi yeah, bilinear problem. It's linear in theta, linear in z, and. So you can take the theta f and l outside. Uh, yeah. OK, okay thanks. So you can actually turn this, this problem into a convex quadratic program. So there's a standard trick where you can take these problems that are kind of min-max into min-min or max-min max, max min into max-max. And as you can do this, and you'll get, using duality, you can get a QP quadratic program that solves this problem. I'm not going to go through the details of that, but that's a standard transformation. So once you have that, basically, you have a, a QP that has the number of variables that basically is the number of parameters and the number of potential edges in your training data. Right, so if your training data set, uh, training data set is, okay, can fit into memory, you can hand this to your favorite optimizer and you get theta spit, you know, spit out. Right? So without any sort of actual programming and algorithm, right? this is a, a declarative way of, of stating, this is my problem, giving back my theta. And so this works, like I said, for sequences and other micro random fields, context-free grammars, min cuts that I'll talk about later. And then I'll talk about also when you have uh, models that are intractable. So when that relaxation is not exact, when you're actually losing something there, right? You can also take that relaxation and kind of stick it in instead of the min. So in that case, that relaxation is usually going to be an upper bound on the min because you've, you've relaxed, uh, or actually lower bound on the min. And so you're going to be doing something that's approximate. But in practice, it works really well. So we don't, we're not only stuck to problems that are tractable. We can also use standard relaxation people use in computer science to solve combinatorial problems. We can use them inside of our learning procedure. OK, so um, like I said, you know, we can just feed it to CPLEX or Mosaic or our favorite solver. But uh, when we have a lot of data, which is a lot in, in many of these problems, uh, this is not enough. So, CPLEX and, and MOSA give you super linear convergence in terms of the number of iterations it takes to solve this problem. But um, being linear in size of the data is, is, is not enough to scale up. Right? So a lot of these second order methods that, are, that the CPLEX and MOSA use, they build up something like the, second, or the, the, um, the matrix of all the second order derivatives. So something that's basically quadratic in the number of original variables, you know, broadly speaking. And so, you know, if you give some of these problems that we've solved to, to, to CPLEX, it just chokes, right? After, so if you have, for example, 10,000 sentences to train on, that's about a million edges, you know, a million edges times parameters, et cetera, CPLEX dies at that point, right? So we need methods that essentially uh, trade off between sort of speed of convergence and the amount of memory they need. So the memory is actually one of the biggest bottlenecks in these problems. And this is a method that we've, we've developed to solve this, this, this problem of memory that has linear convergence, so it's very much like gradient. Um, and the method is, is somewhat simple. So we have this, this problem in this kind of uh, settle point form. So we have these two, two different polytopes, right? One is for theta, so assume theta here is some kind of norm ball. And one is z, which is some, some convex hull of matchings. And this is an iterative method where, you know, at every, at every uh, time point we have a current z and theta. And so the steps are, take the gradient with respect to our objective and make a step, right? One, in mean, both of them sort of make a step to a certain direction. And then uh, we need to get back to the feasible space. So make a projection back to the space. So this algorithm, as I described it right now, doesn't work. It has actually, it will never, you know, there are many cases where it won't converge at all. But something like this does, so we're doing these gradients, so we're actually doing two of these gradient projection steps in each step. But the important point here is how do you do the projection step? So the gradient step is easy, right? Just basically computing those matrices is trivial. It turns out that for a lot of these problems, the, the projection step is also something that we can do with a combinatorial algorithm. So 
for matchings and for segmentation models that I'll show later, the step is a minimum cost quadratic flow. So it's a problem that people have studied a lot and um, can be solved also kind of roughly speaking n cubed time. So you know, when we try to solve this, this problem, we don't need a QP solver. All we, all we need is to be able to compute gradients, which is easy, and running this combinatorial algorithm that's essentially kind of like the matching algorithm. It's a flow algorithm that does this. Now for other problems, so something like you know, if you're learning CRFs for sequences or, or context-free grammars, et cetera, this projection, um, if you're doing this projection in Euclidean space, is actually hard. And it turns out you don't have to do it in Euclidean space. So for models that are kind of decomposable, where you can do dynamic programming, we can use other types of projections. Projections that have to do with, say, KL distance. So you can do projection of this point back into the kind of the feasible space by using KL projection. So then the algorithm that we run to do the projection is actually just some product, right? Inference, either, either forward, backward, or inside, outside. Right? So all we need to do to solve these problems is have kind of, you know, around standard algorithms that we already use. All right, so this allows us to basically not depend on QP solvers and just scale up to large problems. Another interesting part of this algorithm is that the number, uh, the amount of memory you need is independent of number of examples, roughly speaking. So we can run in this kind of online setting where we pick up an example at a time, compute what we need on it, which is either min cost flow or some kind of dynamic program, and then we... Um, we forget its z's, right? So we can throw away the z's that correspond to it and essentially have a, a vector that's roughly speaking the size of this theta. So it's kind of like a sufficient statistic vector that we maintain. So we have this method that can just scale up to, to very large data sets. Okay, so if there's any questions, I'm going to move on to the, to the applications of these. Okay, so this is the word alignment problem that I've been talking about. Um, <clears throat> the data comes from, from the Canadian Parliament proceedings. And uh, we have actually a very small amount of training data. And this is part of the, the problem with, these, uh, with these, um, these data sets is that the number of sentences that are actually labeled on this word-to-word -word level is fairly small. So we have a lot of un, unsupervised data where you just have two pairs, uh, two, sorry, a pair of two sentences that are English and French, and we can use that data to generate features. So the features we generate there are things like dice coefficient between words, which is essentially things like, you know, how often do these words co-occur in these sentences. We also train other models, like generative models, on, those, on that data. So we generate a bunch, of, a bunch of features that I kind of talked about uh, using the unlabeled data. And then we have 100 sentences that, are, that um, we train on, and so the two first approaches that I talk about comparing is this local learning and then matching. So the idea is that I'm going to learn a classifier, treating each edge independently, take its output, stick it in the matching, see what comes out. And so there's a dramatic difference between doing that and then using the same set of features but training globally. Okay? So now, the standard, one of the standard... Uh, uh, kind of publicly available algorithms for doing this is this Giza suite of, of, of code that does IBM models, right? So IBM Model 4 um, is one of the standards uh, we, we need to compare to. And so this number here is using IBM Model 4 that trains on all of the unsupervised data and is usually tuned on this 100 sentences um, that we use training for, right? And 6.5, this represents actually a what's called intersected model four. So you learn, train two models and then you, you use their intersection. Just details. And so we're not doing as well as that, but the nice thing is that we can use the outputs of all of the models for, all, all of the IBM models inside our uh, uh, model as, as features. So we can just basically say for each edge, what does IBM model one, two, three, four says? Which way, right? And so that's exactly what we do. We use those models inside of our, of our model as features. And so when you do that, we get a very significant improvement over those models. And the IBM model, uh, that's learned in the IBM models, or is it okay. Yeah, the IBM models are learned generatively, and they use the label data in a very kind of uh, weak way. They just tune hyperparameters. So, yeah. yeah. The training time between these four methods? Uh, yeah, so IBM, turning all IBM models on all of that data takes about mm, two, three days. Uh, our, 
so local learning matching takes about 10 minutes maybe. That's generous. Our approach, you know, half an hour. So this is small, fairly small training data. Right, so. Yeah. Yeah, if I remember the numbers from your uh, EMNLP paper, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 it's slightly different because this, this is a newer NACL paper that we Right, right. But the, 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 uh, what, I, if, what I was going to ask you about is the, 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 uh, I assume there's represent improvements since then, right? But, uh, so I think you had, for our approach, you had 10.6 or something like that at that point, but you still had 5.4. So it looks like you've improved your model but you haven't improved the combination of your model and IBM Model 4, is that right? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think the 10 here represents using better counts. So I think using dice that's collected off of Model 1, mm -hmm. something very like something like basically you do, right? So we're trying to push. We're trying to basically do what you're doing, which is uh, beat Model 4 without Model 4, and we can do that. Actually, I don't have this number here, but we can do that not with a simple matching model. So let me just do this. So our approach, uh, well, actually, it doesn't prove. 5.4 is local learning. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So 4.9 4 .9 is with our approach when we do the global learning, and this is local. So you can see that the difference here becomes smaller. So when you have stronger features locally, global training doesn't buy you as much. And partly is because there's not that much ceiling to go, you know, to, to sort of not much increment to, to leave. But also, there, there's actually very good evidence that this is true. So in, Dan Roth and, and Scott uh, been look, and other sort of people in Dan Roth's group have been looking at that. Um, but but uh, still, there is a significant there is significant uh, amount of improvement you can get. And now, when we try to beat Model Four, so this is actually this is an approach where we use not just uh, edge weights, but we have pairs of edges. So I'll talk about later. Maybe actually, um, I have a slide about this, but I'm, I wasn't going to get into it now is where we try to model not, uh, not just kind of the zeroth order effect where it's all just competition, but first order effect. So things that are, you know, two edges near, two words that are nearby here, right, tend to map to two words that are nearby there, right? So the standard first order effect. So we can do that using quadratic assignment kind of model. Now the inference there becomes intractable. But we can use relaxation inside of the same framework to learn the weights. And then when we do that, we get 4.5. And so this is using Giza inside. If we don't use Giza inside of this first order model, then we can learn something that's basically like 6.4. So it just beats IBM 4 without IBM 4. With IBM 4, it beats it by a huge margin. Question? So the, so the difference in the last two is just the, the training method? It's all the same features? These two? Yeah. No. Co-op is quadratic assignment, so we have first order oh, features. First order features. Yeah. So we have things like Actually, ask me later. I have a slide about which, which pairs we have in there. And that's the, sort of the work. And also, we're using fertility more than just fertility, you know, one. Oh, which buys a lot. Yes? I'm wondering how many scales with them, each of these training algorithms. You gave the times, but I'm wondering how they scale. With, with what? With number of examples? Number of sentences or number of nodes. So with number of sentences, fairly linearly, because, I mean, it might, you might need to do a few more iterations of this algorithm, but that one pass through the data is linear number of sentences. What is what it's not linear in is obviously the size of the sentence. So if we have a sentence that's 100 by 100, it's going to be cubic in 200. Because I mean, realistically, it's not really cubic. It's faster than that. But worst case is that. What's the training time for that last one? Uh, this one's I think two hours because there we're actually not using um, extra gradient. There we're using. Uh, mosaic, and so, so it's I think like yeah, an hour or, so, or two. Yeah, so no, I mean still we're in the regime where we're training that is fairly small, so this is very quick. Um, next problem I'm going to talk about is this uh, a subproblem protein prediction in protein structure prediction. So we have a string which basically is a string of amino acids, and the protein you know folds up into this very complicated shape. Um, one important aspect of this shape that, that helps the protein going to be held together are these so-called disulfide bridges. So these are bonds, covalent bonds, between the cysteine molecules. And these are non-local bonds, so, so things kind of uh, connect across 
from far parts of the, of, the, um, of the protein in order to kind of hold it together. These are some of the strongest bonds in, this, uh, in, in, in the protein. And so the prediction problem is the following. It's given the sequence to predict which pairs of cysteines are going to link up to each other. So it's a kind of a matching problem, but now the matching is not a bipartite one, you know, English words, French words, but, you know, a general matching in the graph. And nature tells you basically that the fertility, right, or the connectivity is actually at most one, either one to one or at most one. So again, this is a very similar kind of problem in many ways, right, is this we're trying to predict the matching given this input. It turns out that we can use the, the, the exact approach that I talked about, writing it down as an LP. There is no linear program that has polynomially many constraints for this problem, but there's another, you know, technique that we can use to basically solve the same problem using an optimality certificate um, that we've devised. I'm not going to talk about that, but um, it's solving the same problem. So here's the data. The data is the standard data set that people have tried this on, where we have crystallized sequences. So we have proteins in the database that so we have their structure. So we can compute who connects to whom, right? So we have tr uh, training data that's labeled. And then the features are very similar to, you know, to the ones we use in, in um, well, in some sense, and the ones we use in, in word alignment is that we take a little window around each cysteine, and we don't know the structure, but we can look at this, this little nightmare, right, this little window in a database of all self structures. And we can see, well, how does this, this nightmare appear? And then we can compute, so we don't know how it appears in this protein, but we can compute statistics on its shapes. So we look at all kinds of physical chemical properties of that, of that uh, of that window, and then we have another one on the other side, and basically we have something that that's try trying to match them. So there's a whole set of features that I'm not going to describe exactly, but but um, the idea is again we're trying to learn the parameter vector for those features, and the features are supplied by somebody, you know, who knows what what they do. And so I'm reporting here accuracy, which which is actually a harsh measure that biologists care about, is that whether all of the bonds are correct, right? So this is not the percentage of things that you get right, but whether you get everything right. So the numbers are actually pretty pretty you know bad in in absolute sense, but this is more or less the state of the art. So first method is local learning and matching. So learn a local classifier that predicts this matching, uh, predicts whether an edge is on, and then stick it into the matching. State-of-the-art methods for this is work by Baldi and others that uses this recursive neural network with four different layers and this complicated thing that takes weeks to train. And our approach is basically something that, that what I described, the convex optimization problem uh, that essentially is getting roughly in the ballpark uh, numbers as that, but takes basically one hour to train uh, and, you know, does on par with it or better. And so we're working now with, with a group actually here uh, in Seattle, uh, David Baker, who is um, trying to integrate this into their system for folding. So basically you can use this kind of thing to, to reduce down the space, the search space for folding uh, much better. So, um, good. And so the last model, uh, the last model we talk about is a segmentation model where you have you know, points in space, pixels in space, and you're trying to label them. So suppose you're trying to label them with building versus tree. And so we have a binary variable that represents the label of that pixel. And then we're going to build this kind of marker random field that, a spatial marker random field that represents um, the correlations between them. So we're going to have local potentials that take into account the uh, local surface, right? So features of the local surface. And I'll show a slide about that in a second what those features might be. Uh, and then we have edges between things that are connected, or sort of adjacent, that represent kind of smoothness that we want to enforce. Right, so the join model is taking the node potentials, you know, and then multiplying the, the edge potentials, and the global, um, the global probability depends on both. So in general, when we don't make any assumptions about this kind of model, it can be intractable to find the most likely assignment. But if we assume that the edges are attractive in the sense that two pixels that are connected by an edge uh, would like to have either you know, be both building or both tree, they, they want to be the same label, then we can use the min-cut algorithm to compute the best segmentation. And the idea be behind the, the, this reduction is the following. So 
what we're going to do is introduce a source and a sink that depend, say, that represent, say, the buildings and the tree. And then we're going to introduce edges between source and sink, uh, between source and sink nodes and the original nodes, uh, which are going to represent the local potential. So, you know, if this, uh, the, the local potential for this node is going to be actually a, become a weight on this edge. And then the edges between the original nodes are going to be parameterized by their um, uh, edge potential. And so then a cut in this graph, a minimum weight cut, which is defined essentially as the set of edges that separates 0 from 1 that has the least weight. The sum of those weights is smallest. What that's going to do, computing this cut, is going to compute for us the most likely segmentation y. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the exact details, but you can kind of see the intuition for that. So again, the same situation here. We have an, uh, uh, an exact, you know, efficient procedure. It's actually n cubed to do this again, or n times the number of edges, so n times m, uh, to compute the min cut. But to learn the models, you know, we need to normalize over all of, uh, all of y's, which is intractable. And so we use the same kind of uh, LP formulation of the inference and, and use it in our framework to learn the models. And so oh, this here are some of the features. For the local features on each potential, we look at a particular pixel and then essentially the depth map around it. Right? So we have, say, we discretize uh, along different radiuses around the pixel. These are maybe in, in um, feet or something like this. And then we have different depth and, and, and number of pixels surrounding this particular pixel at different depths and radiuses. And so the, the feature node features are essentially features that, that track how the local surface looks in terms of this histogram re representation of it. And then the edge features are something like distances between adjacent pixels, horizontal, vertical, angle between their local normals, et cetera, et cetera. So we're learning how to kind of weigh all these together in order to do the segmentation right. And so this is data collected by, at Stanford by um, a robot the robot by, by uh, Sebastian Thrun and Mike Wintermerla. And so it has this little laser, laser range finder that basically collects this huge cloud of points. So this, this, um, this data is, is very large. It's basically tens of millions of points. And we, we collected some, some small subset of it, about uh, 30,000, and labeled that into actually four different classes. And then we tested it on, on this large set of the other ones. Uh, so let me just show you an example of what it looks like, the output of, that, uh, of our algorithm. And so yeah, this is kind of the back of the Stanford quad. As you can see, this pretty well on, on trees here, getting all of them to be green. These are the, um, the buildings are mostly right. So this is blue is the bushes, white is the ground. It does not so, it doesn't do so well on palms, because uh, what it needs to do for, for palms, it needs to recognize that they're not columns, right? And so certain, the column looks fine, you know, palm and column look fine until you get to the crown. And if the crown is really high, the um, kind of the spatial smoothness has to be propagated down from very high up from far away down to the very bottom. So it does that for some of the palms and not for the others. But, but in general, it does really well. And so in terms of quantitative comparison, we compared it to, again, a method where we do local learning and then local prediction, local learning and then smoothing, and then our approach. And it does, so this is a small subset of actually of this, of this data where we, it was easy to label a whole bunch of pixels that are part of a building, a whole bunch of pixels that are part of a tree, and we evaluate our algorithm on that for uh, quantitative, uh, yeah, quantitative uh, evaluation. Um, so I'm going to summarize here. Um, this is, I presented here, a, a framework for, for learning a whole set of different, different models. I talked about these three, but like I mentioned before, there are many more models that fit into this, into this class. And so when other me methods are not tractable, we, we have something that's efficient and stable and uh, convex um, algorithms that, 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 that scale to very large data sets. And, um, I think this brings us much closer to kind of the holy grail, which is principled end-to-end -end learning in these hard problems. So how can we learn to propagate the errors that we get in translation all the way back the pipeline um, 
to to you know generating phrases and and, and learning a, a language model? How can we sort of look at the you know native confirmations that we get in in protein folding and propagate it back to the all the way back to the sort of parameters for the search for finding the best the best model? So I think these kind of techniques are going to help us um, build much better prediction systems um, when we have latent variables, we have interactable models for prediction. And so these are some of, the, some of my collaborators and colleagues that I'd like to thank. Thanks. Yeah? Uh, so, so, so these techniques are, uh, are useful, especially when, the, um, when it's interactable to parameters you can have work with them. If you could say whether there's any way that you can, well, and another advantage of your approach is that you can incorporate a non-zero and lock, right? But um, I'm curious whether there's any way that you can use, if there's any natural way to use a non-zero and lock on uh, those problems where you can do uh, max likelihood estimation, and if there's any natural way to, in to incorporate that. Yeah, so we've used this for sequence labeling uh, as well, and then there, what this buys you is that you can you can right so you can basically play with things like precision recall and now this loss function actually in sequences it doesn't have to decompose as uh, by node by node it can also be you know on edges as well so you can have a loss function that says you know, suppose basically in in, in say named, named entity recognition your evaluation method is something like precision recall on entire entities. So it's not something by position, but it's in these kind of larger chunks sometimes. So you might want to have um, a loss function that tracks larger chunks, right? And so and it's fine as long as, as basically your loss function decomposes in the same way your graphical model does. Then you can do this efficiently still. And so I haven't played with it too much, but one of the things we've done is, is in the simple cases where you have node-wise loss function, play with precision recall, right? So you just have, you know, when the model is... Um, Predict, over predicting, you, you you penalize false you know false positive or false negatives more or less, but yeah, but you can do this for tractable models. You can play with the loss function and and you have much finer control of this, right? So so maximum likelihood kind of is good when you're well getting every you know your evaluation function is getting everything right or everything wrong, right? It's sort of finding the most the the most likely prediction and predicting with that is, 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 is suited for the zero one loss. But when you have these kind of more flexible, more flexible um, loss function to worry about, this is one way to incorporate them while still staying kind of convex and, and, and tractable. There's no way that you can use a, a non-zero one loss on a, uh, for, for max likelihood estimation. No well, I think you would be, and people have tried to do this. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think once you start changing, like, it's not going to be max likelihood anymore. It's going to be something I don't know. Yeah, way to my I don't know. Yeah, so it's it's not has been as successful. People have looked at actually at other ways um, of uh, so other functions that are not decomposable node-wise or edge-wise. So things like like f1, etc. And it seems like f1 it doesn't really buy you all that much over something like this where it decomposes. But but people actually looked at more more expressive functions inside this framework. So, um, yeah, so in, imagine sort of minimizing something like blue score or something, you know. Uh, and, and, yeah, that's, that's, that's very difficult. And what we've done in that case is something that, that, that correlates with blue score, which is, you know, again, looks at, like, single and, and double and, uh, uh, unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, et cetera, et cetera. So, so yeah. Thanks. Good question. So I think that all of your stuff, you're assuming that your, your training set is fully labeled. So these Ys are very complex. So can you talk about what uh, the impact is of having uh, partially labeled Ys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these particular methods, as I described them, uh, yeah, I assume, assume labeled data. And uh, we're looking into different ways to use semi-supervised data. And so some of the same methods apply where you can basically optimize over both the parameters and then the best kind of completion for the hidden variables, right? So, you know, like the way the SVMs deal with, say, transductive setting or semi-supervised approaches for SVMs. They essentially search for the best labeling of the unlabeled data as well as the parameters, 
Does that make sense? So, so some of that stuff applies here and becomes uh, much more computationally intensive, obviously. And so that's something we're pursuing. We're also pursuing some other kind of methods that are, well, not exactly you know, uh, of the same form, but essentially use ideas from like co-training. So other ideas that people use for flat classification, but now where you have two simple models and you want them to agree, right? So in co-training, you're trying to make two classifiers agree. Here you might have a bunch of hidden variables, say in word alignment, and you're trying to make them agree on the alignment. Right? So something that we've done is basically take a model that does English to French, French to English, and then it's all unsupervised, but we're trying to make them um, represent the data well, but also agree on their hidden variables. Right? So it's kind of like generalization of co-training to this kind of structured case. And I think that, you know, that could be also pushed much farther. That's something I'm looking at right now. Um, yeah, definitely. Latent variable, I think, is in the structure prediction case is kind of the next frontier. So about, have you, you said that you motivated this by saying that in some cases you can't do the likelihood, conditional likelihood training because it's intractable, but um, it may be that this, you could get better classification performance by training in this way as compared to um, uh, maximizing the conditional likelihood. Have you looked at um, your, your method of training these models with the uh, untractable problems? I mean, yeah, I'm so sure you can train it, you can maximize the conditional likelihood. Sure, yeah. So we tried it for sequences, yeah. So for sequences, for example. Yeah, so for sequences, um, in the problems I've tried, it does better, either slightly better or on par with the other models. Um, I think there it all depends on incorporating the loss function well. So it matches or does better, I think. In terms of claiming that it's always going to be better than conditional likelihood, I don't think I'm going to say that. I think in some, so there is, you know, the, the questions are between when would you use logistic regression versus SVMs. Right? So it turns out that you know, there's some justification for using SVMs when there's a really a good kind of uh, clear boundary between so positives and negatives. Right? There's kind of a low noise scenario where there's always really one tr true label for each example. While a regression does better in some sense with, when the prediction is, is hard and, and, it's, uh, and there's a lot of noise. So it's close to kind of half and half. Right? much more washed out probabilities. So I think the same kinds of ideas apply in term here, right? If there's really kind of a one good answer, one mode of the distribution given the, the features, this approaches will do better, right? So if you're talking about sequences. When there's a lot of sort of wishy-washy uh, kind of space, then, then maybe likelihood approaches will work, right? Um, I don't think this is going to be always better. One more? Yeah, one more quick one. Do you think you could use extra gradient for standard uh, SVM training and how would it compare to SMR? I think you can do it. Um, I didn't compare it to head to head to S SMO. Um, SMO is really good at a lot of things, you know, especially when it's kernelized. So this is non kernelized. Uh, you can kernelize this, but it, but the solutions that it's going through are not going to be sparse, like SMO. So SMO basically starts with something very sparse and then you know, builds stuff, uh, builds the solutions incrementally, and so it ends up with something fairly sparse. So when you're doing kernelized SVMs, I would I would bet an SMO, as opposed to this, which will have something that's not sparse. When you're doing uh, linear kind of kernels, right? It's not kernelized, then it it, it might be comparable. Um, I don't have had had, had to had to had comparison, but this kind of stuff is, is similar. I mean, there's so many algorithms for for SVMs that. It's not really clear we need a new, another one, you know. Um, but um, for these kinds of problems, you know, suplexes isn't a worker. And as, I mean, we have an algorithm that's kind of like SMO for problems like sequences. Here it doesn't work for problems that are matchings, et cetera. Uh, so, 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 yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend just trying to work on another SVM uh, learning algorithm. Questions? Thank you very much. Thanks.